today is Thursday. Do you, do you need to talk to me today, or is it okay? Somebody else is talking? Today is Thursday, April 29th. Uh, it is 4 o'clock. We're in the House Lounge at the State House. And today's agenda is the, non, the non-emergency medical transportation for older adults and Medicaid recipients, commonly known as MTM. So today, um, I thought Ben Schaefer, the Medicaid Director from EOHHS, the Executive Office of Health and Human Services, Ben, I thought you might give us an update of where we are because we certainly haven't spoken to you in a very long time. So Ben, I'm going to let you go first. Welcome, Ben. Oh, roll call. I keep forgetting. See how long it's been? Zaire, I'm sorry. Okay. Chairwoman Serpa? Here. Rep Casimiro? Here. Representative Norray? Hi. Here. Representative Agello? Here. Representative Baptista? Representative Carson? Here. Whip Chippendale? Rep Court Friend? Here. Here. Rep. Donovan? Here. Here. Rep. Edwards? Rep. Falella? Here. Rep. Handy? Rep. Hawkins? Rep. Knight? Here. Rep. Lima. Rep. Messier. Here. Rep. Newberry. Here. Rep. Place. Present. Rep. Slater. Rep. Solomon. Here. Rep. Speakman. Here. Chairwoman Williams. Present. That concludes the role, Chairwoman. Thank you. Thank you, Zaire. Okay, sorry about that. So, Ben, I'm going to let you begin with an update from your perspective from your office, if you don't mind. Of course. Good evening, everyone, Chairwoman Serpa and members of the committee. It's very good to see everyone again, and it has been a while. Um, I'm very pleased to be here today to update you all on EOHHS's non-emergency medical benefit and our transportation broker, MTM. As you know, non-emergency medical transportation, or NEMT, is a mandatory Medicaid benefit. Under this benefit, Medicaid members can receive rides to medical appointments if they do not have means of getting there otherwise. Such appointments can include dialysis, cancer treatment, substance abuse disorder treatment, primary care visits, and adult day care, just to name a few. EOHHS relies on a broker model to administer, coordinate, and execute this benefit, and to credential and manage transportation providers to ensure that they transport members safely. EOHHS transitioned to this broker model in 2014 And after a competitive procurement in 2018, MTM replaced Logisticare, the previous broker, in January 2019. In the shift to the broker model and to MTM has been an overall benefit for the Rhode Islanders we serve. Rhode Islanders are getting more service. MTM provides four times the number of rides in one year compared to the non-broker model. Rhode Islanders are getting that service, more service, for cheaper. MTM's cost per trip was $12.50 in 2019. The non-broker model was $36 per trip in 2011. And Rhode Islanders are seeing more trips with MTM than they did under the previous broker. Trips increased by 400,000 in calendar year 2019, the first year of the contract, 
a 20% increase over the previous broker. After a difficult transition two years ago, we have improved significantly. Complaints are down 85% from 2019 to 2020. In 2021, the number of missed trips for any reason, including member cancellation or no-show, was just 0.32% on average per week. And this is out of an average of almost 35,000 trips per week. DOHHS continues to hold MTM accountable, as we do with all of our contracts, but in particular for this one, given its importance to our members and the difficult transition. In particular, we hold MTM accountable for seven specific quality measures on a monthly basis. If any of the seven are not met, this results in a $28,000 reduction in payment to MTM the following month for each of the conditions that is not met. Through this contract management, we have assessed a total of 280,000 in quality withholds to date. Wow. I should note that these quality withholds are in addition to any previous liquidated damages that we have held against MTM. In addition, MTM and EOHHS staff meet twice per week, now via phone because of the pandemic, previously in person, to review complaints and troubleshoot any other issues. I received data updates on MTM, the number of trips, and the number of complaints weekly. The transportation team meets with MTM monthly for formal active contract management reviews. We meet as a Medicaid team, as an EOHHS team, all together in our regular performance management sessions with EOHHS every eight weeks to review MTM data as well as other performance data across Medicaid. And I have quarterly strategy meetings with MTM leadership. On top of all that, I'd like to give the committee a sense of the benefit we are seeing for our Medicaid members through this contract. Last month, 56,000 trips were made for Medicaid members and um, older adults to substance abuse treatment. Almost 6,400 trips to receive dialysis. 810 trips to primary care almost 400 trips to the dentist in one month. Without this benefit, the service provided by the transportation providers and the broker MTM, these Rhode Islanders would be going without life-saving and preventative care. And it's important to note, as I know the committee is, was, wanted to understand and wanted to uh, review, these trips did not stop during the pandemic. And all the numbers I just quoted were from March 2021. With that said, it is important to note that the overall volume of trips is indeed down due to the public health emergency. Compared to the last quarter of 2019 before the public health emergency began, trips are down by about 25%. When we look deeper at the data, we see that some trips have remained steady and largely unaffected, including trips such as SUV treatment, dialysis, and cancer treatment. The most impacted trip areas have been those services that have been restricted due to the pandemic, especially trips to adult day centers. Other members and providers are utilizing telehealth during the public health emergency, likely saving a trip, but still getting care. And we think, we believe this is especially true and the data shows it's especially true uh, in the case of behavioral health appointments. We do expect and expect to see that as we reopen and as we recover from the public health emergency, member demand will return, and with it, the trips that we saw prior to the public health emergency. I want to emphasize, however, that we cannot just wait and see if demand will come back. As an entire state, we have to make sure people are reconnected to the care that they may have put off or otherwise delayed. As we build back better from the pandemic and work as an entire health system, manage care organizations, doctors, community health workers, hospitals, to make sure that people have the care they need, reaching out to more Medicaid members and older Rhode Islanders to take advantage of this benefit is paramount. If you need a cancer screening or a well visit or a vaccination and you are on Medicaid or an older Rhode Islander otherwise covered by MTM, transportation need not be a barrier for you to get the care that you need. Making sure we reconnect folks to this care will also increase trips for transportation providers with a corresponding potential increase in their revenue. 
I want to close today by speaking a bit about our experience with this benefit and with MTM during the pandemic. I believe representatives from MTM will speak in more detail to this, but as I noted, throughout the pandemic, MTM and the transportation providers have been hard at work. They have continued necessary services following CDC and RIDO guidelines to keep people safe. They have transported Islanders to testing. They have transported Islanders to monoclonal antibody treatment for COVID. They have transported COVID positive members to dialysis. And they have and continue to transport Rhode Islanders to get vaccinated. And the transportation providers have done this with care, with skill, and with compassion. More than that, I will share with the committee that MTM has been an exemplary state partner throughout this pandemic. The pandemic has tested all of us, and we at EOHHS have relied on all of our partners, providers, managed care, community organizations, to deliver needed care and work together always going above and beyond. MTM has been one of those partners. I remember this fall, just prior to back to school time, I was walking in downtown Providence on Saturday afternoon near my apartment along the river uh, towards the pedestrian bridge. Uh, the sun was shining, and, and to be very honest with you, I was, I was pretty happy to have a bit of a break. Um, of course, uh, my phone rang, and as part of our collective whole of government response, it was someone on the COVID team wondering if I thought MTM could help transport kids to school if necessary. A couple, couple of phone calls and texts later to my unbelievably dedicated and professional EOHHS team, and MTM was connected, again over the weekend, to folks at the Department of Education to help provide backup transportation for back to school. I know we all have stories of neighbors, friends, colleagues, community leaders helping out in this incredibly difficult year. I know I have many, but I did want to make sure I shared that small one with the committee. Thank you for your time today, and I certainly look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Ben. I appreciate that. I'm glad that you mentioned um, that the department was going to try to reconnect with the more frequent users of this service who had maybe not been using it as frequently or at all during the COVID um, epidemic, and obviously it's not over yet. So what specifically is your department going to do? What is going to be a process for outreach to try to encourage these people to get back to their doctors who are no longer participating in telehealth? And I don't know if any of the senior centers are open yet, but what, what's your outreach going to be yeah. exactly? Yes, no, thank you for the, for the question, and I'll, I'll, we've thought a lot about this, so I'll, I'll try to give you a succinct an answer uh, as, I, as I possibly can. Um, for, for those, uh, you know, members who would have otherwise been going to a senior center or to, you know, adult day, we, we, we wait for those, you know, to open back up, and we're in, in um, you know, pretty regular contact with those uh, representatives. Um, and, you know, as we see them opening back up or as we expect them to open back up, uh, you know, we'll make sure that we're, as I said, monitoring the data on a, on a weekly basis um, to see those trips, you know, recover. Um, and then certainly would expect, you know, if we don't see that to uh, even after, you know, a couple weeks after opening um, to, to start doing uh, more member outreach um, and, and working with those adult day centers or senior centers uh, on who they may still uh, uh, have yet to come back in the door. Um, that, that, I think, is, is probably the simplest, uh, you know, one. Um, that's where we see the biggest drop-off, but we know that, that those centers and other, uh, other locations have been closed um, or operating at a restriction. Um, for other kinds of visits, for, for cancer screening, for primary care, um, for, for dentistry, you know, th this is really where we, we look to uh, engage with all of our EOHHS partners. So I, I mentioned managed care and our, our providers and accountable entities. Um, we have made sure and have started uh, uh, meetings and, and between MTM uh, and, in particular, our managed care entities um, to make sure that as managed care is returning people to, uh, uh, to care, to making sure that they have their well visits, making sure that they are uh, uh, get cancer screenings and whatnot, um, that they understand how to schedule rides, that those rides are easy uh, to schedule, um, that, and that they're sharing best practices uh, uh, with each other. 
Um, you know, we, we, we rely a lot on those managed care organizations and our provider groups to do that care management for the state, but we need to make sure that, that they understand how to use the benefit and those uh, uh, conversations with the managed care entities um, and other providers um, are, are happening on a monthly basis uh, uh, to date. Um, and, and more than that, you know, we, we want to make sure in forums like this and, and uh, anywhere else where we have the opportunity um, that, that we can talk about this. Um, it, it's, I would say it's a bit unusual for people to think of their health insurance provider being able to get them a ride to the doctor. That's not a typical thing, you know, necessarily that folks think of, but it is true for Medicaid members, um, and we need to break down any, uh, any barriers or any uh, misconceptions that people may, may have about that. Thank you, Ben. I just want one more question before I turn it over. I'd like to ask one more question before I turn it over to members. Tell me a little bit more about um, using MTM to transport kids to school. Was that because of the absence of school buses or the shortage of school bus drivers? And obviously, is that allowed by Medicaid? Does that get reimbursed? Yeah, no, I, thanks for the question. I'll let, um, I'll let MTM speak a little bit more to the specifics, but um, certainly we were quite careful to note that uh, it probably was not a Medicaid reimbursable expense, um, and, and um, you know, that, that was going to have any funding was going to have to come, come from elsewhere. Um, but we were particularly concerned at the time, and I believe Ride was concerned at the time, uh, about uh, transportation of potentially medically fragile uh, kids to school, um, or and just in general, given the, the focus on having uh, um, some backup options for transportation providers. Um, so that was really the, the impetus uh, um, uh, for that. And again, um, as part of the whole of government uh, response, um, you know, when that, when that phone rings for any of us, we, we try and um, do whatever we can uh, and continue to do whatever we can, even if it's outside the normal, the normal course of business. You know, nothing about the last year has been inside the, the normal course of business for any of us. And, Ben, is that ongoing then? Uh, is, are those kids still using MTM to get to and from school? Is that still happening? I, I don't believe so, but I'd ask MTM to, to, to confirm. Okay. All right. Any members have any questions? I don't see any hands up, I don't think. No one has any questions. Uh, Chairwoman, I, this is June Speakman. Yes, June, please go ahead. Representative Speakman, please go ahead. Thank you. The, the data that you presented were great. Do we have those in written form somewhere? Or if you could share those, I would love to have them at hand. If you don't, if you don't I, certainly, I certainly can. I, if we re my inbox is crammed, so if we receive them, I miss them. Thank you. And then um, maybe MTM is going to answer this about the financial impact of the pandemic on on them, uh, given the number, the decrease in the number of trips that you talked about. Is that for them to talk about, perhaps? Um, I, I'll I'll speak generally to it, and if there are, are sort of more specific uh, questions, um, we'll, we'll um, sort of you know obviously take those as they come. Um, as this benefit, um, the broker model, I should say, uh, is administered on a capitated basis. So we pay um, a, a set amount per Medicaid member to MTM uh, to arrange the benefit. It's the same kind of arrangement that we have with our managed care organizations. We get a per member uh, per month uh, dollar amount for, for Medicaid members. Um, so uh, that will change that obviously a total amount of revenue will change um, depending on Medicaid role enrollment, you know, not necessarily on, uh, on how many trips they, they have, um, at least from a top line revenue perspective. Yeah, thank you. That, I, I forgot that part. So even if they may have had far fewer trips because people were doing telehealth, they were still receiving the same payment throughout for each member, right? So yeah, and that's, con that's yeah. consistent. Yes, that's correct, and that's consistent with you know the other kinds of uh, healthcare contracts that we have uh, through Medicaid again with with managed care, and um, you know I think there's a couple of, of benefits you know to that. One is um, you get a stable uh, uh, 
broker operation in place that doesn't you know sort of widely vary. Um, two, there's more when you have a uh, more of that guarantee. Um, there's an ability to do more of those outreach and for MTM to in, in, to invest in in in, uh, in outreach uh, and in and in the service. Um, and then you know more for the state. Um, we gain a, a lot of, of financial stability uh, from that arrangement. Um, and, you know, that kind of risk work, works both ways. Um, you know, if, if, we, if Medicaid enrollment goes up or down, um, you know, we can forecast it, we can plan for it, uh, which is tremendously helpful from a budgeting uh, perspective. So I'm, I'm also concerned about the drivers themselves. Many of them are small business people, many from communities of color. So the, the company, MTM, was receiving the per capita fee. But then uh, maybe, again, we'll get into this later about what effect it had on the, the folks who were actually delivering the service. Yeah, certainly I'm, I am con want, as, as I mentioned, you know, part of the goal uh, on returning people to care and after the pandemic um, is so that those transportation providers um, who might have otherwise been transporting Medicaid members uh, can do so again now that uh, it's you know it's safer to do so and safer safe for people to return to to care. Um, but certainly we expect and do monitor um, that as that uh, demand returns, uh, that MTM have the transportation uh, network in place, have the providers in place uh, to meet that demand. Okay, let me try this one more time. And I'm not being critical, I'm just trying to figure it out. So checks were written every month from the state of Rhode Island to the company, to MTM, right? Regardless of the number of rides they were giving, because it's on a per capita enrollee basis, right? So it strikes me as possible that this was an in, uh, a windfall for MTM. I understand what you're saying about needing to have stable relationships with the brokers. I get that. Um, do we have any information about about that, about the relationship between the money moving from the state of Rhode Island to MTM and the money moving from MTM to the drivers? Um, we, we collect that and certainly um, I, I don't have it right in front of me. I don't want to give, you know, obviously make up any numbers. Um, certainly, um, from what from what we understand and what we sort of gathered um, across, you know, the health insurance system, um, that it, that people delaying care or not going to the doctor um, means if you're under a capitated arrangement, you tend to do better. Um, and as that changes, um, it, it's possible that organizations will do will do worse, um, and that kind of uh, um, risk taking, if you will, is uh, is part of the contract structure. Thank you. I appreciate the information. Thank you, Chairwoman. You're welcome, Rep. Speakman. And uh, interestingly, there's a nice handout here from MTM, and it'll probably answer some of your questions. So I'll make sure that Zaire puts a uh, sufficient number of sites so that all of you at home can receive one next week at the Veterans Auditorium. Um, did I see some? Representative Messier. Thank you. <clears throat> I have a question about these <clears throat> member complaints. What do most of them have to do with? Uh, arriving late or not showing up? <clears throat> Can you explain yeah, that? Yeah, thank you for the question. And, I, and I'll, let, um, I'll let MTM speak in, in, in greater detail to, um, to, the, to the exact nature. But generally speaking, um, I would say they fall into two categories. Um, and we see a, many of them, the complaints, if they're generally speaking, coming from members or the individual who is, you know, actually getting the ride, um, something may have not gone right with the transportation provider. Um, the, the individual who was, you know, picking, picking them up, um, that's a source of complaints. Um, there may be the other kind of flavor of complaints uh, is um, maybe there was an issue with, with the broker MTM uh, sort of itself that could be, uh, um, you know, some kind of misscheduling or, or other kind of, of, of trip. Um, but generally speaking, on the whole, as I said, we've seen those complaints um, decrease substantially uh, 
um, about 85% of them mentioned year over year. Uh, and we, I'll, I'll let MTM speak to, you know, the, the more specific percentage breakdowns in, in what the complaints that they're seeing. But what we do see, you know, some complaints uh, against transportation providers and then other complaints as well. It really sort of runs, uh, you know, as, as with any kind of complaint service, runs the, runs the gamut. Uh, ben, one other question. MTM, if, if I have this right now, MTM gets paid per Medicaid recipient, whether or not that Medicaid recipient uses the service. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. So w the number of Medicaid recipients has increased throughout this pandemic. So does that, whether or not they're using this service, and my guess is that most of them didn't, because of the pandemic and being in lockdown. So does the increase, does that increase automatically increase MTM's profits? Does it automatically increase or did it automatically increase its bottom line throughout this pandemic? Yeah, I, I'd have to defer to MTM on, on increases to their bottom line for profit, but you're, because profit obviously takes into account other factors, um, but it will increase revenue. Um, that, that's, that's how the arrangement certainly works. Okay. Similarly, as we recover from the public health emergency and as Medicaid uh, is allowed by CMS to uh, begin renewal and termination activity, um, that activity will decrease uh, MTM revenue. Okay. And just a, a question or two quickly about their contract. This contract with MTM, does it terminate in June of this year or in June of 2022? 2022. And the state has three option years um, that it can choose to, uh, uh, should it choose to extend. Choose to extend in lieu of putting the contract out to bid? Correct. And who, who makes that decision, Ben? Ultimately, I make that decision. Go in consultation with, you know, the Secretary of UHHS. Okay. And what are the metrics you would use if you opt to do that as opposed to putting it out to bid? Yeah, we, we whenever we're looking at any sort of procurement, you know, we try and weigh a variety of factors. You know, she, the two that I look to most of all are quality and cost, right? Do I think there's an ability for us to find a different vendor um, or even with the same vendor, you know, require contract changes that will increase quality uh, of the service. Um, and then similarly, um, do I think or, or that there might be vendors uh, who might come in uh, with lower cost uh, bids for the same quality? Um, generally speaking, that's what we would look for uh, as we're thinking about um, whether or not to reprocure any contract, and then being mindful of the fact that um, you know that that uh, you know takes uh, uh, the opportunity cost of staff resources, if you will, is that where we think we'll get the biggest bang for the state's buck and for um, you know our our employees' time. So putting it out to bid requires a, a lot of use of staff. It, it takes a lot of time and effort. Is that what you're saying? It does, and that doesn't mean we don't do procurements. It means that we try and make sure when we do procurements, we do them for um, we do them knowing that we want to and believe we can uh, increase quality, decrease costs, and ideally, obviously, both. So you could put the contract out to bid, and at the end of the day, decide to extend the contract with MTM in spite of it, right? So you could do both. Is that right? I believe so. I, I, I'd have to look back at the original contract and ask my, my uh, legal folks to make sure that if we go to bid, we don't, you know, lose out on the option years. So I, I, I honestly don't, um, don't know off the top of my head if you, uh, if you can, uh, um, you know, have your cake and eat it too there, so to speak. Okay. Um, but but uh, I can certainly check on that. I will say that we were we're still a little early uh, in deciding, you know, what we would uh, what we would do. But 
Um, generally speaking, because these procurements take time and because we know that uh, if we do it, we want to do it right, that's why we, you know, many state contracts have those option years uh, uh, to be able to uh, extend if you, if you need and make sure, and I should mention that, you know, we we'll want to look very carefully at how things are going in recovery from the pandemic um, before we, you know, potentially uh, make a change in this, uh, in this benefit that, you know, so many folks rely on. So let's just suppose that you've decided you're going to put the contract out to bid. When would you begin that process in 2022? Um, we would probably we begin it. Um, we probably start deciding whether or not we want to to go through a procurement and understand what you know might be in the market. Um, you know, this summer would be my guess, and then. Um, you know, we work backwards from there. I don't, I don't have a specific timeline uh, for you as we sit here today. And then hey, Women's Jeffrey, this is Julie. I have a question for Ben. Sure, go right ahead. Ben, am I hearing correctly that whether or not you go out to bid is determined by the contract and not whatever the state formal process is? Is that what you're saying? No, that, that's that's not what I'm saying. I believe um, that uh, Chairwoman Serpa asked, could we both go out to bid, and if we didn't like the bids that came back or ultimately want to go through with the re-procurement, could we still exercise one of the remaining option years in MTM's contract? Uh, and my answer to that is um, I, I, I think so, but I'd like to be able to check with uh, with legal and purchasing first, because I don't know if, if you decide to go out to bid, can you still uh, exercise an option year? I believe that you can, but I, I don't want to give a you know a, a complete hundred percent definitive answer. Um, I would I, I would like to said, understand I would like to understand if that's for all contracts or if it's like on an individual basis. I guess is my question. Yeah, and as, as I said, I just I before I speak with a hundred percent certainty on something that. Presumably, is written down in state purchasing law, or um, or in an, and certainly in the contract. I, I want to be a hundred percent sure. Um, right. so I don't Th wanna, thank you. Um, give ben, one last question for me. I promise. Um, I'm I'm just trying to look into the future. Let's just suppose that you and your staff decide to put this out to bid. You, you in fact, you, I think you said it earlier in your presentation that the transition from Logisticare to MTM was less than smooth, less than cooperative. So being aware of that now, what, what would you do differently? Have you thought about what you would do differently so that let's just suppose another company won the bid, ABC Transportation. What would you do differently so that MTM would transition easily to ABC Contracting? Have you thought about that? Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't. That is one of the things that, as we think about what we will do with this contract, um, that we will, you know, consider. I would say, you know, in, in greater depth. To be, to be very frank with you, our our focus has been on, uh, you know, for the last year has been on making sure individuals that still need this service uh, are getting it throughout the pandemic. And as we said, as we you know recover from the pandemic, that we return. Uh, individuals to care, uh, and that transportation need not be a barrier there. Um, but, but conceptually, I would say there, there's two things that we uh, uh, would look for, and this would be the case with um, with any contract, you know, be it a UHHS contract or not. Um, one, you want to make sure that you, the whoever you have uh, coming in to replace an existing vendor, can actually do the job. I, I, I feel like that's obvious, but. Um, I, it's not a um, that, that's not a given. Uh, plenty of people tell you they can do things, and then you you get the RFP responses, and you have to evaluate that with uh, uh, um, you know a, a, a pretty fine tooth comb. Um, the second and more specific to this contract is that making sure you can come uh, in and quickly in a transition program keep the network in place. Um, right, transportation providers are the ones who actually, you know, make folks, uh, you know, take folks to and from uh, wherever they need to be. Um, so breakdowns in that network or breakdowns in the scheduling of those rides, um, changes in those underlying technologies um, from one broker vendor to another, 
um, are, are where we could potentially see problems in a transition. Uh, so that is something we would look for very carefully uh, if in, in any uh, if we ultimately decide um, to uh, to reprocure the contract. Be that um, you know in in as this original contract comes up, um, or be that in in three years when when the you know the options are up. You know the, the these are not uh, indefinite. Uh, contracts because uh, uh, it, it's important that uh, you know otherwise you, you test the market. But we do always weigh that against uh, transition costs of a variety of of of, of, of types. Mm -hmm. So, are you saying that there were transition costs when we went went from Logisticare to MTM that wasn't built into the contract? No, I I, I sorry, I mean meant transition costs a bit more broadly. Um, certainly, there are any transition costs in of of you know bringing folks on and and you know staff time and the like. But you know, I, I as I said in my opening statement, I, I think I I called the transition difficult, and it was um, you know before my time as Medicaid director. But I was you know in in the agency working uh, in different places, and I understand how every uh, how hard everyone uh, worked and how hard MTM worked um, to right the ship. Um, we'd be having a very different conversation if um, the numbers that I quoted around complaints being down and missed trips being down and um, overall trips continuing during the pandemic uh, um, were in a different place. So we have to take very seriously the potential uh, uh, transition impact that it would have on, on, on members um, as we would with any direct service uh, uh, transition. Okay. Thank you, Ben. I appreciate it. Are there any other questions for Mr. Schaefer before I let Mr. Stolberger and Mr. Hines speak from MTM? Uh, Representative Noray and then Representative Cotrevan? Oh, thank you, Chairman. Yeah. Um, ben, quick question. Who answers the phone when complaints come in? So, not to... It, 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 uh, not to answer a very simple question with a um, longer answer, but certainly there, if you call MTM, obviously the MTM um, to the call center really answers. We also get complaints directly to EOHHS. We forward along to, uh, which we forward along to MTM. So um, either one of those, depending on, on who uh, a member or transportation provider or, or happens to reach out to first. So a follow-up question to that, I guess I'll break it down. So. Uh, on a typical month, how many complaints do you receive, not you personally, right, but your office receive versus how many complaints that MTM receives so that we total it up and, we, you know, we get 10 here and five there, so we have 15. Yeah, yeah sure. So we, I'm going to use the data that I have from the last full month, so March of 2021. Um, we got 18 complaints into EOHHS in March of 2021, thereabouts, and uh, MTM got 92 complaints uh, to them um, in, in March. So I'm going by the data I have is week by week, so there may be some overlap into February and into April, but, you know, rough numbers um, is about what we got. So MTM gets the bulk of, of the complaints. Uh, as and that's uh, you know part of of, of what they uh, are required to research and understand to make sure that they uh, continue to improve uh, service. And and last part of this, so and I'm not making an accusation that they're not reporting, but so potentially we rely on their accuracy and reporting to determine the number of complaints that are coming in to effectively get that the percentage so that they know whether or not they're getting their full pay or they're being held there's restrictions and then we're holding money back um i, I think the, look the most direct answer to your question is yes. yes i mean if 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 there if you know someone calls in and it's not getting logged in in complaints that's obviously going to be difficult to track. What I will say is um, we do get, uh, in particular, escalated complaints and make sure, EOHHS, I mean, uh, and, and follow up, as I said, you know, twice weekly with MTM. 
Um, I should also mention, and this would have been, uh, I think, when we last met in, in, in February or early March of 2020, right before the public health emergency really uh, uh, kicked off, um, you know, I mentioned that we were conducting an audit of MTM's complaint procedures uh, and, and data. Um, and, and that audit, you know, found, you know, no, uh, no concerns in this area. Um, and we went in, looked at the universe of samples, randomly selected complaints from each quarter of 2019 and reviewed them uh, across 11 different elements. Um, and while there were, you know, while there's always room for improvement, um, we did not find, you know, evidence of, of, uh, of anything untoward. Um, and the last thing I'll say to that is because these are, you know, uh, uh, parts of a contractual process, um, doing, and you didn't suggest this, but I just want to say it for the record, should any vendor with the state be, mistracking or willfully, you know, not producing that data or not putting things in the system, um, that would be Medicaid fraud. Um, and not, not only the state would have an interest in that, but the federal government, who also ultimately pays for a significant portion of the bill, uh, would have an interest in that. And um, I, I have a fair deal of, uh, a lot of confidence that people don't want to run afoul of that. Um, and in particular, any company that, that does business in multiple states, because uh, that would seriously jeopardize your ability to continue that business. And absolutely right. And I, I wasn't in any way, shape, or form making that accusation. I'm just, again, trying to find out is that how the complaints come in. So thank you. You answered my question. Yep. Appreciate it. Thank you. Representative Cochran? Thank you, Chairwoman. Um, thank you, Mr. Schaefer. Uh, how often is, does your census count for billing? How often do you review that? Um, because since we're paying per person. Yeah, so we review, you know, obviously for state budgeting purposes on a six month basis um, in the caseload process. So we just testified in, in caseload on Monday. Um, I. I believe that is how often, similarly, that we, you know, will change with, with MTM. I, I want to double check with the team, though, that we don't do it monthly. Obviously, we do monthly enrollment reports as well. Um, so let me take that as a follow-up because I want to make I, I, overall for caseload projections for Medicaid, we update them every six months. But let me make 100% sure um, that we don't do something slightly different in this contract. Okay, thank you. And um, one follow-up question. So when there's a new person comes on to the Medicaid rolls, how do they find out about this service? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we, you know, I, I think there'd be a handful of ways, and there's not one sort of direct answer. I'll give you my preferred way. I mean, one, you know, I think um, uh, we've talked a lot about this, this contract and this benefit. Um, we engage with um, the public in a variety of ways. We have a Medicaid uh, advisory council who we talk to um, about general Medicaid issues who uh, often, you know, who have both uh, members of the community as well as community advocates and representatives. Um, I've mentioned managed care a number of times, but those are the uh, entities and individuals that are responsible for the care management and coordination uh, uh, who, you know, can know about the benefits and, and see if someone's missed an appointment or um, reports on a on a, a survey or, or risk screening that they don't have adequate transportation, um, and then I'll add one more, which is we build you know we as we build towards more integrated and complete primary care, uh, we hope and and want to encourage and want to work with uh, Medicaid providers and our accountable uh, care organizations uh, to do so as well. Um, so a, a lot of different ways someone someone can find out about it. Um, I don't think there's any sort of one, you know, way uh, uh, that someone will, but certainly it's, it, I believe it's included in, you know, the kinds of explanation of benefits and what's covered that, you know, you'll, you'll get from any health insurer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rep. Cortburn. Anybody else with questions? Oh, I'm sorry, Representative Place. Uh, thank you, Mr. Schaefer. Uh, going back to checking the information in terms of the complaints from MTA, from the from the company, does your department proactively reach out to any of the customers or any of the people that use this service 
just as a, as a, I don't know, just as a, a way of double checking the numbers? Like, do you conduct any kind of surveys of the people who use the service? Or do we solely rely on the, the provider's internal data? We will rely on provide on the provider on MTM for the overall numbers that I'm I'm quoting you. But certainly, when we get a complaint um, directly toward to us, uh, you know, we will not just liaise with with MTM, but uh, you know, understand what that complaint is and and follow up uh, to make sure that it's properly resolved and that we see documentation of that of that resolution. Just just a thought. I mean, I know doing business with a lot of different companies, what they'll do is they'll proactively, and as the oversight agency, you know, proactively send out a survey to so many participants in the program just to get a feeling for the accuracy of the complaints. And just as a thought, understanding you, you know, you have to do, you, you have to work within your limitations, but in the future, if we work that into the system to proactively have that survey pushed out and get that information brought back to the state versus the actual provider without it being filtered. I think that may bring, you know, allow people to feel more comfortable about uh, the complaint information. It's a, it's a great thought and I, I, I appreciate that. It gives me a, an opportunity to uh, remember and, and say that while not specific to uh, the NEMT benefit, we are actually live now with a Medicaid managed care survey um, it's on our website. It was emailed to every Medicaid member. We had an email on file. It was mailed, uh, snail mail if we didn't. Um, and uh, that survey is a, is a broader uh, uh, survey about how well we're doing in, in, in Medicaid managed care, what we could improve, again, what's working well. Um, we're particularly proud of that. We, we um, are, are trying to push it out as broadly as we can. Um, we translated it into 13 different languages uh, and are really trying, to your point, to um, uh, get as much feedback as we can from, um, from Rhode Islanders about our, our program. Um, that, that just went live last week, I believe, so uh, way, way too early for data, but we certainly will be looking at, uh, uh, at transportation as a part of that if it comes up. Well, thank you very much. That's good to hear. Any other questions? Thank you, Ben. But you, oh, Representative Whit Chairman William Williams, do you have your hand raised? Yes. Okay. Please, please proceed. Hi, Ben. Good to see you. I haven't seen you in a long time. Good to see you. I see you haven't lost your your gift of the smooth operating. You know, it, that's a compliment. Take it as a compliment. I say, you know, hey, when you got it, you got it, and you got it. Um, I would like to um, just go over a couple of things that you mentioned. Uh, first is um, the kids, the transportation, but I, I think that that's for, um, that would be better served because you gave a general answer and I want a direct answer of what has been taking place, you know, so, um, and I appreciate you mentioning it. Um, I, I definitely uh, I'm, I'm not in favor uh, or supporter of an agency monitoring, policing their own works. For example, when you said, uh, when uh, Representative Place asked with regards to um, anybody doing a survey to the client, my question also would add on. Anybody doing a question to the places that they're being taken to? Is that in any part of the survey? Um, good to see you as well, first of all. Um, the, so I think what you're asking is, have we surveyed or as a matter of oversight, do we talk to the adult day centers or the dialysis centers or the nursing facilities from which individuals may be, you know, picking folks up or, or something like that. Um, I, I don't believe we've done a sort of, you know, an official survey, um, but certainly for the last, um, uh, well, during the pandemic, 
um, you know, once a week, we've been meeting with representatives from uh, uh, nursing facilities and assisted living and, and some of the representatives uh, from adult day. And, and if there are issues, they, they certainly raise them. Um, prior, obviously, to the public health emergency, we, we met slightly less frequently, but still, you know, generally speaking, once a month at least. Um, and that is, has often been a way in which we have uh, either heard or not heard uh, uh, issues uh, related to, to MTM or the NEMT service. So since I know you like direct answers, have we done a survey? I don't believe so. Do we try and reach out and through separate channels and other provider associations? Yes, yes we do. Um, so I want everything documented when it comes to MTN, and I would like to see that coming from the individuals who are not only receiving the services, but where they're being taken to and from those entities in, in some type of form where if in fact they are uh, lie about it, as you mentioned, uh, talked about, it would be uh, Medicare fraud that their uh, reporting would be also considered uh, fraudulent um, because it would be. Um, but in those meetings that you say that you've been having them, you know, once a week or what have you, or more frequent than before, are you meeting the same meetings that were being had once a month or once every two months? I, I, are those the same meetings before the pandemic? Yeah, so I was speaking, yeah, so I was speaking more generally about you know per meetings that we have as the OHHS um, with different provider organizations. So specifically to the weekly meeting, um, I uh, join almost every week um, a, a meeting that the Department of Health continues to have with. Uh, nursing homes and assisted living residences, which obviously are, are big transportation of parts. Um, so that was specifically the weekly meeting that I was referring to. And then prior to the public health emergency, uh, we generally speaking meant uh, uh, monthly, um, uh, at least in a formal way, but um, you know, touch base as, as necessary about, about other questions. So because my I'm, point I'm, being that- No, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, so my, my point being that while those meetings are not specific to MTM or the transportation benefit, um, it has been an opportunity for uh, those kind of providers that I mentioned, or at least their representatives, um, to raise any and all questions that they may have um, related either to uh, Medicaid operations or, or in this case, you know, RIDO operations and, 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 and COVID. So I was attending these meetings before COVID, and the attendance was very poor. So have they, uh, in their continuation, have their participation numbers increased? And if so, increased to what? And who, are, who all have been attended? And you don't need to yeah. go through that if you don't have that information right now. But I would like to get that information in writing because I asked for that before and I still have not received it. So um, that yeah. would be greatly so appreciated. Will... Understood. I believe there's been a couple of stakeholder meetings during the public health emergency that were like the ones you went to, uh, you know, prior. Um, and but we'll be sure to follow up with more specifics uh, on that after the hearing. Greatly appreciate it. And you mentioned that um, these drivers, uh, transportation individuals have been uh, um, transporting COVID positive patients. So how, what was the protection that was provided to the transportation individuals by MTM or the department? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll let uh, MTM speak more specifically to that, but certainly um, there was very early uh, securing of face masks, gloves, cleaning supplies, uh, which were distributed to transportation providers at no cost to them. Um, as the public health emergency continued, um, we made sure that MTM was, as the broker, was part of uh, uh, the provider networks that could get uh, and secure PPE um, from the Rhode Island National Guard and other sources um, so that individual transportation providers did not have to, uh, to do it themselves. Um, there was also a testing policy that was put into place um, and, um, you know, similarly trying to uh, make sure both for members and drivers um, that risk was reduced. So in particular, 
Um, whereas prior to the public health emergency, you might have multiple individuals in one car, um, particularly if they're going to the same place or was on the way. Um, that multi-loading of members uh, was suspended uh, uh, during the public health emergency. Um, so PPE testing um, and obviously not social distancing in the car, but having only one uh, member uh, per transportation provider to make sure that uh, uh, people are as safe as they as they can be. So this has been what you've been told to go right along with a few of the uh, transportation. I you were a little garbled there, but certainly I know that we um, that I, that PPE was provided. Um, that multi loading no, was. Suspended. You didn't hear what I what my question was. Is this the information that was provided to you, or did you do some ride-alongs to see what was actually taking place? I did not do ride-alongs. I did verify that there were certainly PPE was procured and that it was um, possible to continue to procure through state sources, as I mentioned. Um, and I will say we, you know, did see. Uh, uh, we do know that multi-loading was suspended and supposed to be suspended. Uh, because we reviewed and uh, um, I saw evidence of complaints on uh, when that wasn't happening. Um, so we, we know it was supposed to be happening and, and we um, reviewed and uh, 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 investigated, MTM investigated complaints um, when they were brought forward that it was not occurring. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Not satisfied, but um, thank you. And my last question is, um, the contract you keep, you have said that it's a three-year contract, but actually it's a three-and-a-half-year contract from the time that it started. So will that also play a factor if, in fact, you decide to renew this problem that we have and have had, been having, in spite of your compliments that you have provided to us? As, as I said, you know, Chairwoman Williams, I we look whether or not to re-procure a contract um, as to whether or not we think we can get better quality, reduce cost, and preferably both. And that, that's what will drive the decision uh, on, on this contract as well. The question was the three and a half years opposed to the three years. The other part was that, you know, it is what it is, but I'm, I'm questioning that you keep saying three years and it's three and a half years. What, that will not, whether or not we exercise an additional option year, or the, whether it's three or three and a half years, will not have an impact on the decision. Good, thank you. I'm good for now, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chairwoman. So, last call. Any other questions of Ben Schaefer from anyone? Okay, and Ben, you will stick around in case we have questions at the end, please. I'd appreciate it. Of course. Okay. So, um, Mr. Stahlberger and Mr. Hines, are you both here? Yes, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, here. I think Paul Hines is as well. Hi, Mr. Stahlberger. Yeah. Nice to see you again and welcome. Haven't talked to you in a while. And um, is Mr. Hines here as well? Yes, ma'am. I'm present. Okay. Do, have you decided between yourselves who's going to speak first? <laughs> Does yeah, it I'll speak first, sure. and um, actually, sure. Paul's going to run the slide deck that you referred to. Sure. Um, go, go he's right actually going to run that from his computer. Go right ahead. So, yeah, that'd be great. Um, thank you, Madam Chairman, by the way, um, and members of the committee. It's good to see you as well, um, members of the Oversight Committee. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be in front of you again this evening to give you an update on kind of the overall NEMT program in Rhode Island. Uh, just want to thank Director. Schaefer for his testimony is hard work uh, and he's very accurate in holding us accountable as he mentioned. Um, I just want to run through, I know some of you may have access to these to this information already. Uh, regardless, I want to walk through just some of the things that we've been doing. Um, so we can bring some slides for you. So yes, MTM has coordinated more than 1.8 million trips in the past year. Um, and yes, that, um, you know, complaint percentage is 0.038%. Um, still, that's 695 complaints, um, and we would say that's 695 too many. Um, and just in anticipation to in hearing some of the questions already, um, just want to say that, you know, our, probably our top five complaints um, of those 695 um, are due to 
either uh, transportation provider no-shows, um, late pickup times, uh, trouble with service, um, et cetera. So it's mainly around transportation providers and the service that your members get, our members get. Um, so while we're, we're happy with these numbers, we know that there's a lot, still a lot to improve on. Um, we're very grateful to the members of our team that have made this possible to and made sure that transportation providers um, that continue to want to do the work uh, through us uh, thick and thin help make Medicaid more successful. And obviously we can't you know, talk about this last year without talking about the pandemic and how this whole last year has impacted um, your constituents, you yourselves, Medicaid members, uh, transportation providers, et cetera. Um, we would not have been able to have these numbers had it not been for people like John from j &E Transportation that stuck with us um, and has become a really good provider here in Rhode Island. So we value and appreciate the transportation providers that stuck with us. And as we'll get into, there are some that uh, frankly chose not to uh, during COVID, which is unfortunate. Uh, but we continue to um, work with our transportation providers to make sure that we are giving the best possible service uh, to everyone that needs a ride. We didn't anticipate, obviously, um, nobody did uh, 18, 24 months ago, uh, the fact that this pandemic was going to happen. So, um, again, couldn't say more uh, about our, our network. Um, so far, as Director Schaefer talked about, we've transported about 3,000 people to COVID uh, testing. Uh, almost 500 members to their vaccine appointments. Um, every day we coordinated transportation for COVID positive members to their life sustaining appointments um, from dialysis to cancer treatment, et cetera. Uh, but the numbers don't always tell the entire story of what we have been doing and what transportation providers have been doing um, or what the, our you know, partners with the state, cross state government have helped us to do. So just want to give you a brief summary of what our work has entailed uh, during the pandemic. Um, to go back to um, PPE, MTM did secure free face masks, gloves, cleaning supplies. Um, as soon as we heard that there might be a shortage, uh, we were there to help distribute to the transportation providers directly to keep them safe, to keep those providers who want to continue working uh, on the road and in business. Um, that was our, our primary function is to make sure that those providers had the access to that PPE. We know it was hard um, and we worked with them to make sure that happened. Uh, we voluntarily limited the act of multi-loading. I think as Director Schaefer uh, talked about uh, for our provider network uh, prior to the Department of Health uh, recommendations. Um, and for those of you who don't know, traditionally we allow transportation providers to have multiple people in their vehicles to create efficiencies within the system. We felt this was good for everyone, both to keep members safe and also transportation providers busy to make sure that they continue uh, to work during COVID. Uh, we coordinated with EOHHS to develop a COVID transportation testing policy. Um, that policy was drafted pretty quickly and it was approved by, by us in the state. And within 48 hours, uh, Governor Raimondo and uh, kind of made sure everybody knew what the rules were regarding uh, COVID-19 that following day. Um, and upon the delivery of our initial uh, PPE, MTM worked with the National Guard to secure further PPE for our transportation provider network. Um, again, nobody knew this pandemic was going to last this long, much less occur at all. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we were helping drivers um, stay safe and um, keep our members safe as well. Um, we did increase reimbursement rates to providers um, during the COVID pandemic um, for testing trips and other life-sustaining positive trips. We felt that it was important for them to continue their um, um, continue our mission of making sure people are getting to and from their appointments even during the pandemic. You know, the effect that all this has had on, on frankly, on our office and our um, ability to do this um, had a lot of impact on our employees or work from home agents. We wanted to ensure that uh, Rhode Island transportation providers were, uh, had the business, had the whereabouts to continue operating. Uh, we made sure that continued to answer the calls. Uh, we did, we were, we were forced to change our employment process a bit across the state, again, for working from home. Um, so that any, any organization in, in the entire state, including all of us here today, um, had to make changes. Um, we did waive all financial liquidated damage penalties for transportation providers when they were late, if something happened um, during the pandemic, to accommodate the changing and difficult landscape during the pandemic. Uh, again, nobody could have anticipated this happening, so we did 
uh, suspend any further penalties uh, among the transportation providers. And for nine months, we waived uh, certain credentialing requirements on providers, ensuring uh, continuity of their reimbursement was, was happening. Certainly there's gonna be hiccups. We know that sometimes there's snap losing technology um, and we were hoping to um, get those taken care of as quickly as possible within the 90 day filing limit for reimbursement. Um, we worked and assisted providers uh, in Rhode Island to be MBE and WB certified. Uh, we know it's a cumbersome process and we want them to um, get as much uh, acknowledgement as they deserve uh, for being uh, successful businesses in Rhode Island. So in addition to our normal network within Medicaid, as was talked about earlier, uh, we did work with the um, Rhode Island Department of Ed Education to secure transportation for students with disabilities. Uh, yes, this was new for MTM, um, but we were able to utilize our existing transportation provider network, uh, keep those transportation providers busy, and help Rhode Island students get to and from where they needed to go. We did work with EOHHS to allow members utilizing the elderly transit program, the ability to receive reimbursement for transporting themselves through our gas mileage reimbursement program. We did spend quite a bit of time educating our provider network on both the Department of Health and the CDC guidelines. Uh, I'd be remiss if I said that um, you know the feds obviously had rules that needed to be followed and that came through the states and through us, et cetera, to make sure that uh, we were following guidelines on vehicle cleanliness, um, loading multiple passengers and vehicles, uh, creating safeguards to ensure transportation providers were able to comply to this new program. Uh, we worked with the Rhode Island Department of Health on all contract uh, tracing requests. Um, frankly, it's again, um, during during this pandemic, uh, more communication needed to happen and that's what we really tried to facilitate. Uh, we developed and implemented a policy with the support of EOHHS, nursing homes, ambulance companies to cover transportation services for members whose Medicaid eligibility was pending. Uh, sometimes this can be difficult, as was talked about earlier, when somebody just gets on to Medicaid to make sure that um, they can get still get the ride. Uh, we did work with the department to make sure that actually occurred. Uh, we also also worked with Central Falls and the Community Provider Network of Rhode Island to streamline the COVID-19 vaccination transportation scheduling for vulnerable populations. Um, this was very important for us and working with that group and they've been very supportive of MTM and these services. In, in all of this, um, we also did launch um, some new transportation provider tools that would hopefully make their jobs easier. And again, we understand that some transportation providers have troubles with technology and we're here to help make that work better for them and, and uh, train them to make sure that the tools that are provided free to them um, for our providers um, are helpful, whether it's electronic signatures, uh, et cetera. Um, we wanted to make sure they had the tools necessary to be successful. Um, again, supporting from the support with the department, um, a policy for rapid scheduling transportation by managed care organizations to vaccine sites uh, that have excess or leftover inventory of um, COVID vaccinations uh, for, for those that are expiring. So we wanted to make sure that um, we get as many people vaccinated as possible. Uh, we did offer the use of our transportation network to deliver meals and other essential items and made sure that transportation providers knew that we were trying to help them um, really be successful in Rhode Island um, as much as we could. And again, I'm really proud of our team. Um, again, we still have a lot of work to do. We don't rest on our laurels. Uh, we know that through this pandemic, sometimes that's when you find out kind of what people are made of. And again, we're very proud of the, the transportation providers that we work with um, to perform the 1.8 million trips um, in this past year. And I also would be remiss if I didn't just give you all a quick update. I, I don't recall if we talked about this at the uh, last oversight hearing, but uh, Congress actually did make some changes at the federal level. Uh, up until this year, the non-emergency medical transportation benefit was frankly only in federal rule. And this left that rule basically up to interpretation for any administration. Uh, Congress um, felt that we might need to put this in federal law and Congress enacted legislation that puts non-emergency transportation into federal law and clar clarifies that states um, have the responsibility and have the clear direction to make sure this benefit continues. We worked with our competitors, we worked with transportation providers, uh, hospitals, managed care companies, over 25 different organizations to support this legislation and make sure that um, this benefit continues and that transportation providers um, are able to stay in business. Again, we know that um, this 
contract this industry, healthcare is not perfect, um, but our, our commitment remains to continue helping those who need it. Uh, again, MTM is not perfect. We never, never said we have been, um, and we want to make sure that we continue to make strides in helping improve services in Rhode Island. Um, I do want to acknowledge that, some, again, some transportation providers have had difficulty adapting to the technology and the platforms we use. Um, Representative Serpa and I did have uh, probably 16 uh, emails over the past year where some transportation providers needed help. Um, making sure that they could use technology, whether it's a payment issue, et cetera. Um, we do rely on technology to improve efficiency and ensure compliance with federal guidelines. Uh, that technology can sometimes be difficult for some to use. Uh, we provide as much training um, as they need to ensure that all of our transportation providers can use the programs and be reimbursed for their work in a timely fashion. Again, we know those can be hiccups. We want to work with them to make sure they continue to do that. We'll continue to pr provide support to them any time to make sure that uh, they are compliant. Uh, and part of our job is to make sure this contract is compliant. Um, unfortunately, 11 of our providers did leave our network during COVID due to the pandemic. And we now have 79 providers working with us every day. And as I noted earlier, uh, we made a number of adjustments to our operations uh, swiftly, quickly, uh, to include waiving credentialing for a period of time. The pandemic allowed um, providers some extra time to credential their vehicles and drivers. And I want to underscore that we always communicate clearly and repeatedly when we're going to make, uh, when we're going to have any issues regarding liquidated damages. And that we always prioritize member safety, uh, compliance, and operating with state guidelines. Um, and finally, before I wrap up and um, take your questions, I just want to highlight a few of the transportation providers that we really enjoy working with over the years. Um, like they've gone above and beyond uh, what we could ever ask for. We, we know that this is a tough business. Uh, in, a, in addition to doing great work and providing high quality services to our members, they are collective, they are collaborative and offer always offer suggestions on how we can be better. Um, John from JE, as you saw in that first slide, uh, John's been transporting more COVID positive valves um, members than any other provider in our, in our network. Uh, John became one of our main partners for COVID positive transports, uh, ensuring dialysis members continue to receive this critical and timely life sustaining treatment that was. That was him. He made sure that the, that happened. Uh, I also want to recognize Jabil from Care One or um, Transportation. Um, they've been our largest provider in recent months, regularly transporting more than 200 people per day to adult day facilities around the state. Uh, Jabil has assisted many of these facilities in coordinating COVID test uh, transfers for their for their members, ensuring these facilities can are uh, reopen in a safe manner. Uh, and we really want to commend him for all the work that that they've done. Um, and I also want to um, highlight those from uh, Mushala Transport. They swung into action with one day's notice uh, to send their fleet out to Newport and assist in transporting members to uh, one of the first COVID-19 vaccination um, sites in the area. Um, again, without them, uh, this, this program wouldn't be successful. These are just three of our nearly 80 providers who have done incredible work during, during COVID-19 and we all a debt of gratitude to them, and we appreciate everything they've done. Um, I'm happy to answer your questions. I may have answered some of them uh, during this, but uh, I will stand for questions, Chair Serpa. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stolberg. Uh, members, if you don't mind, I think I'm going to let Mr. Hines uh, do his presentation, and then I have a couple of questions. So, Mr. Hines, welcome, and I'll let you proceed, if you don't mind, please. Oh, thank you, Rep. Sorry. I was actually sharing while Phil was speaking, um, and it was just to coincide with um, some of the things Phil was mentioning. Oh, you have nothing prepared to speak formally then? You, you're here for questions? Correct. Is that what you said? Okay. Um, so I'm going to begin. Uh, Mr. Stolberger, not the cover sheet on the handout, but the very first page regarding the complaints. Could you just generally, the second bullet, the second bullet, give us an idea of the nature of the complaints you received for that March 20? uh 2020 through march 31 2021 just could, were they were they bulked in any area oh, or mr heinz either one of you yes yeah, so, so i'd like to take the question so the top five complaint categories were actually results of provider performance uh, our top complaint was provider no show at pickup followed by provider late return time um, and then provider behavior provider late pickup um, and provider service 
Um, we actually have about 20 different categories that we utilize um, when we categorize complaints, so it really allows us to identify what issues are actually occurring um, and where we need to target our responses to. Driver performance was the first one you mentioned. Is that what you said? Yes, ma'am. It was provider uh, provider no show. So oh, prov one, uh, provider no. Show. Okay. Because I I will tell you that was the number one complaint that I had during this, and then as the um, as time went on, I had a number of complaints about no show, and this was particularly for those people who were receiving the infusion treatments for COVID. And not only once did the driver not show, but one particular woman twice. And when she called the infusion center, they wouldn't even book her for a third appointment because she had already had two no shows. So, um, you know, that that's a serious that's a serious complaint. So no show was the first one. And what was the second one? It was provider late pickup. Late. So when providers late to pick them up from their turn of the appointment. So late pickup. Sometimes it's hard to hear in here. What was the third one? You it was driver behavior. So the actual behavior of the driver. In terms of what? It could be the member might have, uh, the driver could have been rude to the member. Um, they could have been something to do with their driving. Um, just the overall behavior of that particular driver. Okay, and the fourth one was what? It was when they were late to pick them up for the actual scheduled pickup time to take them to the appointment. Late for the return trip. And the last one was? It was, if you give me one moment again, sorry. Madam Chair, um, he, uh, Mr. Hines mentioned that there's several categories, not just five or six. So is there any way possible that we could get the presentation that they have, you know, that they're doing today for us to do our due diligence and take time? I'm trying to write just as you are on what is being said. It'll be a lot easier, I think, for me at least, if we had, if I had a hard copy of what they have and what they're presenting to us today. If there's no objection, that would be my request. Paul, is that possible, do you think? Absolutely. Okay. Send out there today. And, and as I said, it is difficult to hear in this big hollow room. It's got an echo and I'm, I, like Chairwoman Williams, I'm having a hard time hearing it too. So that, that would be good if we could get it in writing. And then um, I had a question regarding the drivers. During COVID, I, I see that you, what did you do? You offered an incentive to the drivers. I saw it on one of the pages. The drivers who agreed to pick up, uh, I saw it somewhere, COVID um, positive uh, users of the service. Did I see that somewhere you provided a? Yeah, yes, ma'am, that's correct. We did increase the rates paid um, for both COVID testing um, and any confirmed K positive cases of COVID. Now, did you have to order, offer that incentive because you had a hard time getting drivers or drivers just dropped out because they were afraid for themselves or their families? Is that correct, right? it was the first. It was the first. We did have an initial um, difficult kind, uh, time finding providers that are willing to accommodate COVID positive members. So have you re-engaged those providers as things begin to open up and, and hopefully people are re-enrolling in the service? Are, are, the, are the drivers coming back or is that still a problem? So in terms of uh, increasing the rate, we actually only did that for COVID positive members. Um, we only had difficulty covering trips where there was a potential where the driver themselves could be um, infected with COVID. In terms of the overall driver landscape, we did lose 11 providers, but our existing providers were able to accommodate the remaining trips, um, minus the COVID positive trips, um, without too much issue. As tr uh, trip volume is ramping up, some of our providers have communicated to us that they are having trouble attracting drivers back in um, due to the competitive labor market. Uh, they have Amazon hiring at $17, $18 an hour. Um, and there's just the overall labor market has, has been has taken a real hit. Um, and we actually have just this week locally with our logistics department have looked at ways we can assist driver, assist providers 
uh, in recruiting drivers, be it helping them with a job fair, potentially offer some type of incentive for new hires. So it's something we are actively looking at. So I guess it's easy enough to conclude that the drivers who work for themselves got that, they realized that financial incentive themselves, but drivers who worked for, say, larger transport companies, do you know, in fact, that that, re that extra incentive, that money was actually distributed down to them, or did it stay with management? Do you have any way of knowing it, or did you give it to management of that company and say you distribute it as you see fit? Do you have a way Correct. of knowing that? We pass it? it directly to the company itself, um, and the company owner is up to um, pass it to however they see fit. I will say the vast majority of those that did elect to do COVID positive transport are one and two car uh, operations. So they should be realizing the majority of the um, actual incentive itself. So what did that equate to in terms of real dollars? What, what would you say a driver could earn given the incentive? What were they earning per hour about? Um, so it really depended on the nature of the trip, how far it's going, what's the trip type, if it's confirmed positive or it's just testing. Um, the actual incentive itself could range anywhere from twelve fifty, twelve dollars and fifty cents per um, each for each way of the trip. Up, I've seen it go up to as high as one hundred and fifty dollars. Um, again, depending on the nature of the trip. Now, is that incentive still in place? That incentive has actually been dropped. One thing I'm very proud of is we were able to get our drivers um, registered as first responders and first in some of the first ones in line for the COVID vaccination itself. Um, these were drivers that um, were facing potential COVID exposure on a daily basis, ensuring that members got to their appointments. So it was very important to us that they were safeguarded um, as much as humanly possible. Um, since that time, since we did get about 50 drivers initially, um, vaccinated, we have dropped the incentive. You have dropped the incentive? And just before I open up to questions, the last comment or question that I have, uh, in addition to the complaints I received in terms of the provider no-shows, the other complaints that I received, and there were several of them, and I uh, forwarded them to you, Mr. Stahlberger, and, and Paul, I don't know if you were carbon copied in those complaints, but it was from lack of company reimbursement. I received a number of complaints about that where there was still a disagreement. The company said you owed them X amount, but you folks determined that it, it was X amount, which was typically lower. And those were the same problems we saw at the beginning of this contract. So, and I will admit, and, and I assume it's because we haven't been using you as much, I will admit that those complaints are fewer, but they still exist, that there's a discrepancy between what the managers say they're owed and what you folks say they're owed. So oh. I just wondered how widespread that was. And either one of you can answer that question, Mr. Stolberger or Mr. Hines, it, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I'll, I'll maybe start and then I'll let uh, Paul fill in the gaps. And, and you're correct, you know, the, the 16 emails that I did get from you um, about um, certain provider complaints, um, some of them probably were some of the same providers from the very beginning that maybe had a difficult time uh, either using this technology, understanding how claims processing worked, um, and just some of those difficulties maybe haven't, uh, they haven't worked them out yet. Uh, Paul's team has been working diligently to try to make that happen, to help them understand that, um, you know, signatures and all those, all the proper protocols in order for a claim to be paid um, need to happen. And, the, and those claims can't be paid until all, all that information is collected. And oftentimes, even though they did the trip, um, and all the data wasn't uh, sufficient to state standards, um, we we're not allowed to pay that claim. And so we did have to have some okay. uh, discrepancy conversations with some of the transportation providers, but I know Paul and his team worked pretty closely with some of them to work that out. Well, Mr. Schoberger, um in the future, and you know, I didn't see any responses to, for, from you to me, but I know I forwarded every complaint I got to you. So in the future, when I get those complaints and I forward them to you, I would like some kind of response that it was, you know, improper, incomplete protocols, incomplete paperwork. I would like some kind of response as, as during the process. That's, that's why there's a discrepancy. And then when you resolve it, how it was resolved. I would appreciate sure. that in the future, if you don't mind, because I, I never heard back, and I probably sent you, I don't know, seven, eight, ten of them. So I, I really would like to know in the end how it's resolved. 
Sure, absolutely, Madam Chairman, Chairwoman. And, you know, I did respond to every single of the 16 emails that you sent to me. 16? Um, okay. 16. Yeah. Um, and oftentimes it was maybe, maybe it was a big uh, solution to the problem. I will happy to be more specific, but in every instance, um, I did reply to your email and make sure that you knew that was taken care of. I'll provide more detail next time. Okay, sure I would exactly I would appreciate what the that. Detail was. I don't sure. have any other questions right now. How about other members? Representative Messier, please go ahead. Hi, um, my question is, who is uh, MTM billing for the rides to schools and for the rides uh, for people pending Medicaid eligibility? So for the rides pending Medicaid eligibility, um, we worked with EOHHS to come with, um, up with a, uh, a solution that allows them to gain access to the transportation benefit while still being under that pending um, status. Um, when a member is converted to eligible, MTM receives a retroactive payment from the time uh, um, of the application um, that would make us whole for the transportation of that member. And then for the actual school children, we ended up transporting roughly five students um, for just under a week. Um, when it came down to billing, um, the result was that it wasn't really worth our time for uh, to get the reimbursement from the Department of Education. So we actually just ate the costs ourselves. Um, we did make a formal introduction with one of our largest transportation providers to the Department of Education to kind of segue um, and take over that responsibility from MTM so they could be billing um, the Department of Education directly. Thank you. Thank you. Chairwoman, this is June Speakman. Yes, Representative Speakman, please go right ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen, for your report and for uh, lifting up the names of some of your providers who acted as frontline workers during this time. Um, I have a couple of questions to refresh my memory on how this whole system works. When you refer to members, uh, how many members, how many Rhode Islanders are members of your, of this, this system? I believe for uh, March it was 336,000 and change. I don't know the exact figure. So, 300. So that is, that is the entire Medicaid population for the state of Rhode Island, 336,000 people. Is that right? That is the entire Medicaid population that receives the transportation benefit. So that's what comprises your membership, right? And, and you receive a dollar amount for each of those 336,000 members. Is that correct from the state of Rhode Island? Correct. Okay. Have a good um, is that the same dollar amount for each member? It is a separate payment that's broken down into three categories based off of age. Um, there's children, adult, and elderly. Um, it is a separate payment category for each, uh, uh, excuse me, it is a separate payment for each category. Can you tell us what those are, what the dollar amount is that's associated with each category? Uh, I can give you a rough estimate. I, I can get, certainly get you the exact figures um, after this. A rough estimate's fine. Yeah. Sure, sure, it's approximately $3 for, um, a child, I believe it's approximately $12 for an adult, and it's approximately $32, $33 for an elderly. And that is a monthly payment? A Correct. yearly payment? A monthly that payment? Is a monthly payment, yep. Okay, so you receive $32 for every elderly Medicaid enrollee, right? Every month, okay. Um, so the amount of money that you received from the state of Rhode Island throughout the pandemic was that amount, whatever, the number of Medicaid kids times $3, the number of Medicaid adults times 12, the number of Medicaid elderly times 32, right? That's the amount you received, yes? Is that fair to say? Correct. Okay. Um, do you know how much you paid out to your drivers for transportation on each of those months? I'd love to see the difference, obviously, between what you received, this is what I'm driving at, between what you received and what you paid out to drivers. Can we get that info? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head, um, but I'm sure it's something we can produce. Thank you, I appreciate that. And then did MTM take advantage of any of the uh, COVID-related um, relief programs for businesses? PPP or EIDL or any of those? Uh, I'm not 100% sure at the corporate level. I do know some of our transportation providers did receive PPE benefits, um, but I can't go on the corporate level. 
Okay. And do you know if any of your drivers were eligible for unemployment while they were during for the enhanced unemployment benefits? That's probably more I, of a question for them than for you, but do you know about that? Exactly. It's nothing but anecdotal, but yes, I, I've heard that um, there has been difficulty getting drivers back um, as a result of unemployment, the enhanced unemployment. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks for the information. Thank you, Representative Speakman. Any other questions right now? Representative Place. So I'm, I'm relatively new to oversight and this particular issue. I've only had one interaction uh, to this point with, with your agency, and it, were, it revolved around a person being stranded at a medical provider's facility and no one knowing the fact that they were stranded there. And I'm wondering to the point where they actually had to call me, they called me for help in order, not, not, the, not the member, but the actual medical provider called me for assistance. And I'm wondering, do you guys have a mechanism to actually track when, as you call them, members are arrive at a medical provider and then when they're picked back up on their way back to their home so we know people aren't being stranded? Um, so all our vehicles are actually equipped with GPS. We do rely on the member or the facility to actually give us a call when the provider hasn't shown up at a scheduled time. Um, when we do receive that call, we do do an outbound call to the provider to ask them the whereabouts, um, if there's any issues picking the member up. Um, should there be any issues picking the member up, we do have a tool set available of uh, action we can take. Um, could be as simple as uh, calling another provider, it could be as simple as calling an Uber, um, or it could be more difficult based on the location of where the member is. Um, so there, there are a couple tools, but we do primarily rely on um, notification from the member or the facility. Does that member have a direct line to somebody? Because again, I'm trying to figure out why the, the medical provider has to call the state representative in order to get a response. So does, does the member have a direct line to a specific person that handles if a person should be stranded? Correct, the member is able to call um, the same toll-free line as our reservation line, and we actually have a dedicated option. We call it, where's my ride? Um, it does connect you to an agent or connects you to directly to the transportation provider, um, and you will speak to a live person. So it just sounds like maybe that system failed in this one particular case? Correct, correct. Um, they, I, I believe I remember, I believe it was actually you that texted me um, or left me a voicemail that evening. Um, and I did follow up with the facility. Um, I can connect with you offline about the specifics. I, I don't want to breach any PHI rules, um, but we can discuss that specific member. But from a very high level, that's exactly correct. All right, and I just I just want to go on public. You you are correct. We you know we were dealing. I was dealing with you, and considering the circumstances, you did respond fairly well. And you know again, it's not a criticism of you specifically. I'm just trying to understand how that put how it is that I wound up in the process in the first place. So thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Place. Representative Vigello. Thank you, Chairwoman Serpa. Uh, a question um, on one of your COVID response pages, the second, second item down, collaborated with EOHHS to allow ETP participants to receive gas mileage reimbursements. Does that mean that uh, members are being reimbursed for gas mileage to drive themselves or? Yes, ma'am, that's exactly correct. That is a benefit that existed um, prior to COVID with Medicaid, but was not extended to the elderly transit program. Um, as soon as COVID struck, that was obviously determined to be one of the safest forms of travel. Um, so we did extend that benefit um, to the elderly transit program as well. Uh, M Madam Chairwoman, if I can just add a little more color to um, two things. Just wanted to confirm um, uh, Paul was correct in that uh, MTM did not receive any federal funds um, during the COVID response. We are too large of an organization to benefit from that. Um, and then lastly, the, the last um, the issue with the uh, representative that had a constituent that called him uh, directly to uh, or the facility. We do want to make sure that um, both members, facilities, 
um, have access to not just our number, but our technology. Uh, we'd love to have more members be able to uh, utilize technology themselves to schedule trips themselves with our, our member portals, our member apps, et cetera. Uh, frankly, with technology, those things uh, are coming, and we know not every um, Medicaid member has access to that, but we are trying to make that available to as many people as we can to avoid that very same issue. In addition, we also have something called Marketplace that allows for if there is a member where, say, uh, the transportation provider failed to pick them up, um, we're able to uh, put that trip in a queue, if you will, and have whatever member is closest uh, pick them up and make sure they get to their proper destination. So these are the new technology tools that we continually invest in to make sure that we're trying to avoid at all costs um, member mistrips and errors. Chairwoman? Yeah, I'm, I'm just waiting for Rep. Jello. Are you all set, Rep. Uh, uh, no, it's Rep. Carson. Actually, oh, um, no. I actually thank you, yeah, Chairwoman. No, you, I'm, I'm kind of puzzling on this, um, uh, knowing, being very aware that the cost of my driving to the State House today is um, my cost is greater than simply the cost of the gasoline. I have to pay for insurance and upkeep on my car. So I'm wondering uh, for Medicaid recipients whose income is low, um, is this gas mileage reimbursement more generous than the cost of the gasoline? Um, so right now it is at a fixed rate of 32 cents per mile and that is for both transport on the way there and on tra uh, transport on the way back. Um, I don't, it, it would depend on several factors if it matches the cost of the actual gasoline used, um, but it is at 32 cents matching the Medicaid rate, uh, the Rhode Island Medicaid rate of 32 cents. I'm, I'm sorry, I, it's perhaps it's the it's a auditory situation here. I didn't get the last couple sentences that you said there. Uh, my apologies, I might have um, been speaking too low on my microphone. It, it, it actually, so it's 32 cents per mile and it does match the Medicaid, the Rhode Island Medicaid rate program rate of 32 cents per mile. Um, and that's paid both on the way there and on the way back. And when you say that it matches the, the state Medicaid reimbursement for what other sorts of situations? I apologize. I meant for the state uh, Rhode Island uh, NEMET benefit. Uh, say that again? So if you're both a Medicaid member or if you're using the LA Transit program, you'll both receive that 32 cents per mile figure. No? All set? Okay. I don't think you have your microphone on, do you? Sorry. It's okay. It, um, it ma maybe different words for it matches the state 32 cent reimbursement rate for, for what other program or? For Medicaid. Um, so it, for Medicaid, we had the existing program. It was at 32 cents. We extended it to the Opaly Transit program at 32 cents. You, you extended it to the elderly transit, transit program. Okay. All right. Correct. I got it now. You're clear now. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, I'm sorry. Was it Representative Carson who wanted to speak? She left. She left? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. She left. Any, anybody else who has any questions or who would like to speak here or at home? Okay, well, gentlemen and Ben, thank you for staying with us all afternoon. I appreciate it. I'm satisfied for now. Representative Williams, Chairwoman Williams, are you still there? Do you want to ask any questions? I know you're going to wait for some information. So, Representative Kortrevent, go right ahead. Thank you. I, I got a text. I know what Lauren's question was, <laughs> so I will ask it for her. 
Um, can you, do you require your drivers to post any rules, phone numbers, or other info in all the cars for riders? Yes, we do require them to post um, no, no smoking signs, um, no eating or drinking signs, along with MTM's mm -hmm. contact information and, I believe, UHHS's okay. contact information. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate that. Thank you. Last call. Anyone else? You were at home. Okay. Representative Vigello, go ahead. One quick question. Uh, 79 providers right now. How many, roughly how many drivers does that mean? Um, I don't have an exact figure. I will say pre-COVID it was roughly 300. Um, I have seen it as low as 225 um, at the um, lowest point during COVID. Um, most of our operators are one or two car companies, um, and one of our biggest is no more than 10 drivers. Um, so it's, it should relatively coincide with the number of total transportation providers. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Now, I really think this is my final thank you for everyone sitting in. Uh, ben, I appreciate that you stayed too. I think we're all set for now. Um, we'll probably have you in as time goes on in January and February, and as the close of your, as close as the close of your con contract date approaches, and Ben will want to know what your um, thinking is, and you know why you thought that. And I'm only trying to get ahead of this because I think you know that we've had a problem with contracts in this state. Outside contractors have been a huge problem in this state. And, and MTM, I'm not suggesting that you folks are, but as we've had these oversight hearings, we know that some of the contracts we engage with outside just don't deliver and they cost us millions of dollars. So with that said, last call for questions and um, thank you. I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. Representative Place makes a motion. Representative Jello seconds it. Thank you everyone.